The Weapon by Frederick Brown The room was quiet in the dimness of early evening. Dr. James Graham, key scientist of a very important project, sat in his favorite chair, thinking. It was so still that he could hear the turning of pages in the next room as his son leafed through a picture book. Often, Graham did his best work, his most creative thinking, under these circumstances, sitting alone in an unlighted room in his own apartment after the day's regular work. But tonight, his mind would not work constructively. Mostly, he thought about his mentally arrested son, his only son, in the next room. The thoughts were loving thoughts, not the bitter anguish he had felt years ago when he had first learned of the boy's condition. The boy was happy. Wasn't that the main thing? And to how many men is given a child who will always be a child, who will not grow up to leave him? Certainly, that was a rationalization, but what is wrong with rationalization when the doorbell rang? Graham rose and turned on lights in the almost dark room before he went through the hallway to the door. He was not annoyed. Tonight, at this moment, almost any interruption to his thoughts was welcome. He opened the door. A stranger stood there. He said, Dr. Graham, my name is Neiman. I'd like to talk to you. May I come in a moment? Graham looked at him. He was a small man, nondescript, obviously harmless, possibly a reporter or an insurance agent. But it didn't matter what he was. Graham found himself saying, Of course, come in, Mr. Neiman. A few minutes of conversation, he justified himself by thinking, might divert his thoughts and clear his mind. Sit down, he said in the living room. Care for a drink? Neiman said, No, thank you. He sat in the chair. Graham sat on the sofa. The small man interlocked his fingers. He leaned forward. He said, Dr. Graham, you are the man whose scientific work is more likely than that of any other man to end the human race's chance for survival. <sighs> A crackpot, Graham thought. Too late now, he realized he should have asked the man's business before admitting him. It'd be an embarrassing interview. He disliked being rude, yet only rudeness was effective. Dr. Graham, the weapon on which you are working— the visitor stopped and turned his head as the door that led to a bedroom opened and a boy of fifteen came in. The boy didn't notice Neiman. He ran to Graham. "'Daddy, will you read to me now?' The boy of fifteen laughed the sweet laughter of a child of four. Graham put an arm around the boy. He looked at his visitor, wondering whether he had known about the boy. From the lack of surprise on Neiman's face, Graham felt sure he had known. "'Harry,' Graham's voice was warm with affection, Daddy's busy, just for a little while. Go back to your room. I'll come and read to you soon. Chicken Little? You'll read me Chicken Little? <laughs> if you wish. Now run along. Uh, wait, Harry, this is Mr. Neiman. The boy smiled bashfully at the visitor. Neiman said, Hi, Harry, and smiled back at him, holding out his hand. Graham, watching, was sure now that Neiman had known. The smile and the gesture were for the boy's mental age, not his physical one. The boy took Neiman's hand. For a moment it seemed that he was going to climb into Neiman's lap, and Graham pulled him back gently. He said, Go to your room now, Harry. The boy skipped back into his bedroom, not closing the door. Neiman's eyes met Graham's, and he said, I like him, with obvious sincerity. He added, I hope that what you're going to read to him will always be true. Graham didn't understand. Neiman said, Chicken Little, I mean, it's a fine story, but may Chicken Little always be wrong about the sky falling down. Graham suddenly had liked Neiman when Neiman had shown liking for the boy. Now he remembered that he must close the interview quickly. He rose in dismissal. He said, I fear you're wasting your time and mine, Mr. Neiman. I know all the arguments, everything you can say I've heard a thousand times. Possibly there is truth in what you believe, but it does not concern me. I'm a scientist, and only a scientist. Yes, it is public knowledge that I'm working on a weapon, a rather ultimate one. But for me personally, that's only a byproduct of the fact that I am advancing science. I've thought it through, and I have found that that is my only concern. 
But Dr. Graham, is humanity ready for an ultimate weapon? Graham frowned. I've told you my point of view, Mr. Neiman. Neiman rose slowly from the chair. He said, Very well, if you do not choose to discuss it, I'll say no more. He passed a hand across his forehead. I'll leave, Dr. Graham. I wonder, though, may I change my mind about the drink you offered me? Graham's irritation faded. He said, Certainly. Uh, will whiskey and water do? Admirably. Graham excused himself and went into the kitchen. He got the decanter of whiskey, another of water, ice cubes, glasses. When he returned to the living room, Neiman was just leaving the boy's bedroom. He heard Neiman's, Good night, Harry, and Harry's happy, Night, Mr. Neiman. Graham made drinks. A little later, Neiman declined a second one and started to leave. Neiman said, I took the liberty of bringing a small gift to your son, doctor. I gave it to him while you were getting the drinks for us. I hope you'll forgive me. Of course. Thank you. Uh, good night. Graham closed the door. He walked through the living room into Harry's room. He said, All right, Harry. Now I'll read to... There was sudden sweat on his forehead, but he forced his face and his voice to be calm as he stepped to the side of the bed. May I see that, Harry? When he had it safely, his hands shook as he examined it. He thought, Only a madman would give a loaded revolver to an idiot.